Most of you aren't subscribed. Make sure to subscribe, as it helps out the channel. Without further ado, the series starts with the kingdoms of Rofe, Paradeal, Kanchip, Shoots, Sites and Missian all being absorbed by the kingdom of Ansel, ultimately making the land the empire of Summerfirth. In the year 212, a boy calls out to his younger brother and sister, cries in Ren, asking them to say a final goodbye to their father, watching as their father is finally put to rest. Revealed to be Lord Ars, Ars sheds a tear, all whilst placing a flower on the burial as a final goodbye, turning to face the crowd, only to declare that he'll be in charge of the Luven house moving forward. Flashing back, we see an everyday business worker working his boring 9 to 5, getting ready for work one day, only to suffer a heart attack. Upon waking up, our MC is confused to see a lady admiring his looks, confused as to where he is. Spotting a flying dog, our MC learns the lady is his mother, spotting his child like a reflection in a metal tray. With the year being 200, our MC Ars Luvet was born in Lamberg within the kingdom of Missian. As three years pass by, a maid brings Ars some tea. Shocked to see the three years old Ars is already capable of reading and writing. Ars narrates how he has a general idea of the overall Summerfirth's empire structure, noting how it's quite different to Earth. With the world being filled with magic, Ars reveals that his Luvent family is a noble household, owners of various houses within the land of Lamberg. As Ars walks around his mansion, Ars is grateful to have so many maids and cooks serve them, revealing that he has a skill that no one else has. With Ars sitting in on the house's night sparring, Ars spots two men dueling, using his secret appraisal skill on Malay Crystal, noting how Milias would be better off wielding a bow. Seeing Malay unable to keep up with his training partner, Ars asks if Milias has ever wielded a bow. But Milias states that it's not manly to fight from afar. Using his adorable looks, Ars convinces Milias to give the bow a go, but upon drawing the bow for the first time, Milias is able to flawlessly hit the center of his targets. With the other knights praising Milias for his newfound talent, the knights wonder how Ars knew Milias would be good with a bow. But Ars is forced to lie, knowing that his skill is too rare to reveal, sad that he can't appraise his own skills. That night as Ars joins his family for dinner, Ars' father, Raven Luvent praises Ars for discovering Milius' bow skills, prompting Ars to scan his father's stats. Amazed that his father is capable of defeating ten men at once with his martial arts skills coupled with his outrageous prowess stat. Getting serious, Raven tells Ars that he wants Ars to continue training this instinct of his, as one day he'll inherit his father's wealth. With Ars continuing to read up and learn about the Empire, Ars realizes that the whole empire is corrupt, with peasants beginning to fight back. Luckily nobles have been able to temporarily keep the peasants busy, but eventually the disorganized empire will be overrun with war. Fearing the horrors of war, Ars knows that with his appraisal skill, he'll be able to help out the less fortunate, suddenly running off somewhere. As Ars heads through town, Ars is greeted by all the kind villagers, who Ars begins appraising, in hopes of finding someone talented. Sadly after exhausting his skill, Ars eyes begin to grow tired, sitting down to rest. Just then, a man is seen being thrown out of a store, deemed Malkins by the villagers, as they are people that swam across the sea to enter the empire. Knowing that most Malkins end up becoming slaves, Ars gives the man a piece of bread, appraising the man's stats, shocked that Reet's muses has no flaws in his stats. As Reet's thanks Ars for the food, Reet's attempts to leave, but Ars simply follows Reitz to a nearby alley, asking Reitz to become his retainer. Believing Ars is joking, Reitz is shocked to see Ars offer him such an important job. Reitz wonders how Ars knows so much about a person he's just met. With Ars dancing around the question, Reitz fears that he'll get Ars into trouble, attempting to leave once more. But Ars lures Reitz back in with the promise of rare and delicious meals. As Reitz sits at the same table as Ars, Ars is sad to see that the discrimination against Malkins runs deep. As the mansion's maids and chefs refuse to serve Reitz any pleasant meals. Annoyed, Ars moves closer to Reitz, ordering the maids and chefs to treat Reitz with respect, prompting Reitz to begin indulging in the delicious meals. Ars learns that Reitz originally belonged to a group of mercenaries, but sadly most of the members had passed away and ever since then Reitz didn't have any luck finding any jobs. With one of the butlers asking Reitz to leave, Ars intervenes stating that he wants Reitz as his retainer, telling Raven about Reitz. Ars' father flat out refuses to allow Reitz to serve Ars, 
stating that Malkins have never been heard of wielding skills that can rival nor surpass Summerfordians. Sad to see that his father also discriminates against Malkins, Ars asks that his father simply test Reitz, convincing his father to test Reitz himself. Ars' father states that if Reitz passes, Reitz will start off as a soldier for their family, pleasing Ars. But Ars' father coldly declares that he'll be dueling Reitz for their test. Nervous. Ars reveals that Reitz is only 14 years old, compared to his father that has years of combat experience, but Ars' father reassures Reitz that he'll be given a handicap. As Reitz agrees to the duel, they all follow Raven through the mansion, but Reitz asks why Ars is so persistent on his retainer. Upon hearing that Ars doesn't care about Reitz being a Malkin, Reitz is shocked to hear that Ars needs Reitz by his side for the future, promising to do his best. With everyone heading to the training area, several knights help prepare practice swords and an hourglass, only for Raven to announce that Reitz will win if he lands a single blow within the allotted time. With Ars revealing that his father Raven is by far the strongest within their land, Reitz and Raven begin their duel, prompting Raven to dash forward only for Reitz to barely avoid, having sensed Raven's murderous intent. Reitz is amazed at Raven's speed and power, forced to defend each consecutive strike. But at the same time the knights remark how Raven, even when holding back, dominates the knights, but Reitz seems to be holding his own. Sadly at that moment, Reitz is caught off guard, struck to the ground. But seeing Ars still having hope in him, Reitz gets back up, glaring at Raven. Dashing forward, Reitz slips under Raven's initial slash, using a nearby window to temporarily blind Raven, only to cleave his sword at Raven from above. Sadly, Raven is able to flawlessly block the blow, but announces that the duel is over, revealing that Reitz had cut some of Raven's hair. With everyone amazed, Raven promises to recruit Reitz as a knight, amazed that Ars had once again discovered someone very talented. Raven admits that he had feared Ars would have trouble navigating the world, but is excited to see what Ars will become in the future, jokingly suggesting Ars aim for the Emperor. With the existing knights accepting Reitz as their own, we cut to Reitz all suited up, reporting that he has begun taking up chores around the house. Reitz reiterates his gratitude for Ars, promising to spend his life serving Ars. With several months passing by, Reitz is seen helping out across the mansion, helping move things around, continuing to spar with the mansion's knights, and has even begun studying. In no time, Ars had noticed that Reitz's ingenuity had risen to 89, making Reitz loved by everyone in the household within the domain, especially the maids. As Ars and Reitz studies together, Ars recaps that the continent had originally been split into seven kingdoms, but since the Kingdom of Ansel had access to other continents, it eventually overtook the entire continent, hence the birth of the Empire Summerford. It's revealed that the King Anathas Baidoras ultimately claimed the throne for the Empire, and began his rule 203 years ago. Reitz adds that the Summerfirth Empire is slowly crumbling, as the current sovereign, Baidoras VII, is only eight years old, and is being influenced by his corrupt retainers. It's due to this corruption that several areas had begun to revolt against the Empire, something Ars knows about since his father Raven had to be dispatched to deal with. Fearing that things may escalate, Ars reasons that he needs to gather more powerful and trusted allies quickly. But Ars asks Reitz where he thinks the next revolt may occur. Reitz states that he believes the Missian province is the most likely location, adding that the current governor, Amador Salamakaya, is old and destined to pass away. Reitz reveals that the governor has two sons, but due to their rivalry for the throne, it's inevitable that the sons wage war against one another. Hearing this, Ars gets worried, as his father will have to intervene and pick a side. But Reitz reminds Ars that Raven won't be able to decide for himself which side he should fight for. Ars states that their home of Lamberg resides in the province of Missy and specifically the Kanar district, meaning Raven serves under the Kanar headman. Deep in thought, Ars wonders how he can support his father if they are ever put on a losing fight, but just then Reitz gets excited, reminding Ars that this is their perfect chance to show how skilled they both are. With Ars and Reitz heading to town, they run into Ars' father, Raven, amazed that Raven is training harder than ever. When Raven hears that Ars plans to scout more promising recruits, Raven suggests Ars focus on recruiting magic users, which Reitz knows can drastically change the flow of a fight. Ars remembers a time when Raven had gifted him magical artifact, hoping to see Ars' magical capabilities, but was embarrassed to see Ars was non-compatible with magic. With Ars and Reitz heading to town on horseback, 
they make it to the town of Kaner, a location Reit states houses 50,000 people. Since the town is the capital of Kaner, the town houses the Pyres family, the rulers of the Kanare district. Glancing around, Ars is amazed at how wealthy everyone looks, declaring that he intends to make the people in his hometown of Lamberg rich as well. With so many people nearby, Ars begins appraising everyone, spotting various skills from various people. Sadly after some time, Ars takes a break, revealing that although people may have talents for certain skills, if they don't have the necessary aptitudes of said skills, they simply won't be of use. As the two continue their way around town, Ars suddenly stops, spotting various homeless people hidden away within an alley. Upon seeing Ars' terrified expression, Reed states that where there are wealthy people, there is bound to be unfortunate souls. But before Ars can say anything, Reitz cuts Ars off, reminding Ars that he can't help everyone, not yet at least. Knowing that Reitz is correct, Ars promises to strive for a domain that can welcome anyone no matter their situation, impressing Reitz, but at the same time we see someone listening to their conversation. Finally stumbling onto a market area of town, Ars is completely amazed at the variety of products, drawn towards a stand that sells dragon eggs imported from the northern continent. As Ars dreams of owning a dragon as a pet, Ars rushes to purchase several eggs, but Reitz suddenly pulls out a knife. As Reitz threatens the store owner with a knife, Reitz states that trade with the northern continent was banned recently, deducing that the eggs were possibly smuggled. Plus real dragon eggs would need high temperatures to hatch, whereas the present ones have fake spots on them, allowing Reitz to conclude that the fake dragon eggs are in fact giant lizard eggs. Seeing the store owner trying to scam his master, Reitz prepares to slay the store owner, but Ars tugs on Reitz's suit, defusing the situation. Although Ars appreciates Reitz from protecting him, Ars notes how he'd better learn about these things as well, but they both stop for lunch. As Ars enjoys the variety of foods, he spots a candy store, rushing over to purchase some candy. Just then a person bumps into Ars, using the opportunity to steal Ars' wallet, prompting Reitz and Ars to pursue them. As the thief weaves through the crowd, Reitz, who is carrying Ars, speeds up, managing to grab at the thief's clothes, revealing the thief to be a young disheveled girl. As the girl heads into an alley, Reitz and Ars follow, only to spot the girl being cornered by some men who seemingly knock her to the ground. Annoyed, Ars calls out for the men to stop, prompting the men to attack Ars. But Reitz nonchalantly intercepts the strike. Pissed, Reitz dismantles the three men, scaring them off. Turning to the girl, Ars scans her stats, amazed that the girl is capable of becoming an S-ranked mage, already having 65 points in leadership and 116 in prowess. Ars notes how the girl's prowess is on par with his father's, but her other stats are D-rank, meaning anything not involving magic would be a disadvantage for her. As Reitz demands the girl return Ars' wallet, Ars butts in, asking if the girl would like to be his retainer, but the girl scoffs at the idea, shooting down Ars' offer. Ars states that he knows the girl has a talent for magic, but this weirds the girl out, having never used magic before. Ars reiterates that he has an eye for finding talented people, promising to give the girl a life of luxury compared to her current life, but this only annoys the girl. The girl berates Ars for looking down on her, stating that all nobles were simply lucky to be born into wealth, pissed that Ars is acting like a spoiled noble brat. Ars cries that with the girl's help, he can build a town that can house everyone. But hearing Ars' non-realistic dream, the girl calls out Ars for simply pretending to help out people for his own benefit. Having heard enough, Reitz orders the girl to return Ars' wallet again, prompting the girl to do so. Spotting something around the girl's wrist, Ars asks who the men that attacked the girl were, learning that they work with slave traders and the girl had been captured and sold off as a slave. The girl reveals that she had managed to escape, blaming her beauty for the reason the men are hunting her down. But Ars is curious as to why the girl remains in town even after escaping. Just then several kids swarm the little girl, all crying out to Charlotte, prompting Charlotte to reveal that she can't leave these poor hungry orphans behind. Understanding the situation, Ars promises to leave Charlotte alone. But as a goodbye, Ars offers his wallet to Charlotte, who reluctantly accepts. That night, Ars stares out into the night sky, prompting Reitz to reassure Ars that Ars means good and that there is nothing to feel guilty about. Ars admits that he definitely feels powerless and too inexperienced, but just then Ars spots the orphan searching for him, telling Ars that Charlotte had finally been captured. Flashing back, 
We cut somewhere at night in the town of Canaire. Following a young Charlotte grows spiteful of the rich due to her poor circumstance. Even when Charlotte sought help, she was just thrown aside, making her realize people saw her as nothing but trash. Back in the present, her captors toss Charlotte to the ground, beating her up and scolding her for making things so difficult. Seeing this, the boss reminds his gang to not touch Charlotte's face, reiterating that her perverted buyer wants Charlotte's face intact. Just then, one of the captors notices that Charlotte has dropped a fancy-looking wallet, but this aggravates Charlotte, as she leaps to take back the wallet. Left wide open, Charlotte's head is slammed to the ground, but sadly the boss reminds Charlotte that her life is over, as she has nowhere to run to. As the boss begins making fun of Charlotte's pathetic life, we suddenly spot Reitz break through the nearest door, only to follow up by parrying and striking several of the captors down. Running in, Ars checks on Charlotte, immediately scanning the boss's stats, and demanding to know if the boss, Albert Carnier, is a slave trader. With Albert shocked that Ars knows his name, Albert deduces that Ars is a noble, grinning. Ars demands Albert release Charlotte, but Albert reminds Ars that Charlotte is a slave and can't simply be released. But when Charlotte asks Ars to stay out of her business, Ars reveals that Charlotte's eyes look empty. Ars states that Charlotte's ambition stat is at a 1, a stat that defines how much someone believes in themselves to grow. But seeing as Charlotte's is at 1, Ars get pissed, knowing that Charlotte has been living knowing she has no freedom to live. Hearing Ars's words, Charlotte narrates how she can't remember the last time she cried, stating that her life was decided from the day she was born, but in order to survive she needed to ignore her circumstances and steal. With Charlotte finally shedding tears of realization, Albert calls for the remainder of his men, having had enough of Ars interfering. Luckily, Wrights nonchalantly picks one of the men up from their neck, declaring that the men will die tonight. As the men begin surrounding Reitz, Reitz darts back and forth, evading and slashing the men, but upon spotting several off to the side begin chatting fire spells, Reitz turns his attention to them. With Charlotte shocked at Reitz's abilities, Albert grows more annoyed, calling down his trump card. Marching down the stairs, Albert introduces an ex-military leader, who demands Albert get him more booze. With Charlotte frightened Reitz will lose, R scans the military leader's stats, only for Reitz to disappear, reappearing above the officer, following up by knocking out the military leader. With Albert completely defeated, he desperately reminds Ars that slave trading is legal in town, prompting Ars to offer to purchase Charlotte. When Albert stubbornly refuses, Reitz states that they will be taking Charlotte regardless, meaning Ars is being nice and protecting Albert's reputation. Knowing that there is nothing else he can do, Albert accepts, exciting Ars, as he reveals some people are awaiting Charlotte's return. Grateful, Charlotte asks if she can visit somewhere first, taking Ars and Reitz up a steep hill, only to reveal the vast and beautiful scenery. Charlotte states the view is a breath of fresh air and secret spot she keeps to herself, but this makes Ars wonder why Charlotte is willing to share the spot with them. Turning to face Ars, Charlotte asks why Ars wants to build a town of all things, but gets shocked hearing Ars say he likes children. Ars adds on by stating that a children's smile and dreams can reinvigorate any adult, and it's the children's dreams that will ultimately shape and make a better future. By making a town, Ars promises to protect the dreams and future of people less fortunate, declaring that people won't have to suffer like Charlotte, but Ars suddenly realizes that he's rambling on. Impressed, Charlotte agrees to be Ars's retainer, if it means that the children she's been looking after can have a better future as well. Changing topics, Reitz takes out a magical artifact he picked up from the slave captors earlier, stating that he's curious how capable Charlotte is with magic. As Reitz hands Charlotte the artifact and teaches her how to cast a spell, Ars gets excited, wondering how powerful someone with S-rank capabilities is. Now ready, Charlotte raises up her hand, casting a simple fire spell, only for a massive swarm of energy to form around her palm, only to be shot into the air, creating a massive explosion. Having drawn the attention of all the townsfolk, Charlotte's magical artifact is revealed to have been drained of energy, shattering. With Charlotte asking if Ars is impressed, Ars is completely filled with excitement, which Reitz is forced to admit he's amazed as well. Charlotte asks what she gets being Ars' retainer, but upon hearing that she'll get a place to stay, food to eat and a salary, she asks that Ars send all of her pay over to the children's, as she won't be able to take care of them. 
completely grateful to Ars, Charlotte gets on one knee, promising to serve Ars for the rest of her life. Shocked at how serious Charlotte is, Ars asks Charlotte to be herself, signaling for Ars and Reitz to begin heading home. Remembering that she took Ars' money, Charlotte apologizes, but Ars tells Charlotte it was his decision, beginning to head down the mountain first. As Charlotte thinks about what Ars' future entails, we cut to Charlotte saying her final goodbye to the children she's been taking care of, all whilst Ars wonders if he can really make a great city. Knowing that he can only take it one step at a time, the three begin riding back, stopping to have a quick snack break where Reed scolds Charlotte for eating so manically, but Charlotte could care less, taking a quick nap. Upon arriving back home, Raven refuses to accept Charlotte as Ars' retainer, but upon showing off her magic prowess, Raven changes his mind, immediately welcoming Charlotte as Ars' retainer. In the year of 206, Ars greets his father who has returned from helping solve land disputes in the neighboring province of Sites. Happy to see everyone is alright and Raven was victorious, Raven acknowledges that Charlotte was the star of the show, having grown so much in only three years. Having easily wiped out the enemies with her powerful magic, Charlotte ultimately gained the title of Leuven's Lady of Flames, and her increase in stats ultimately gave rise to a greater mage corp for their family's army. Just then, Ars' mother greets Raven, showing Ars' new twin siblings, Kreese and Ren, to Raven. As Raven admires Kreese and Ren, Ars notes how his siblings will be vital to him in the future, but just then Reitz informs Ars that there may be more talented hunter candidates Ars can recruit. As Ars and Reitz prepare their horse macaroni to visit the hunters outside of town, they both notice Charlotte peeping on them, but when Ars tells Charlotte that they are searching for more skilled people, Charlotte offers to join their search. As the three ride the same horse, Ars feels quite cramped, all whilst Charlotte complains about their slow pace, but Reitz says it's Charlotte weighing everyone down, for not being to ride a horse of her own. Snapping back, Charlotte points out her weight and Ars combined still isn't as heavy as Reitz, asking Reitz to get off and run behind them. Scolding Charlotte for suggesting such things, they both begin arguing who's closer to Ars, but out of nowhere a boar runs across their path, only for a stray arrow to appear, instantly slaying the boar. As two hunters approach the boar, they nonchalantly talk about their number of hunts each, but they suddenly spot Ars and his party, running over to see if everyone is okay. Scanning their stats, Ars is amazed to see the hunters have prowess of 67 and 65, with the older brother Grados having a rank potential for infantry whereas the younger brother Marcus has a rank potential for archery. As the brothers take everyone back home, they are shocked to be served such delectable food, apologizing for barging in on their home. As Charlotte begins digging in, Reitz asks to Charlotte learn some table manners, but getting down to topic, the brother's father asks what Ars is doing here. Ars reveals that he would like to recruit Marcus and Grados for their family's armies, exciting the three men, as their family will get the honor to fight for their country. The father compliments Ars' mature attitude, revealing that his youngest son Rosal isn't as mature as Ars. Curious as to who this Rosal is, a tiny hand suddenly reaches for some bread, quickly retreating back into his room, but suddenly his father calls out for Rosal to properly greet Ars. As Rosal struggles to muster out some words, Ars notes the low stats, but upon seeing that Rosal has the potential to grow his ingenuity stat to 109, Ars chokes on his beverage, knowing that no one would be able to boast a higher stat. Since Rosal is still young, it makes sense for Rosal to have such underdeveloped stats, but knowing that he needs Rosal, Ars asks if Rosal would like to be his retainer. Shocked at the suggestion, Rosal begins fearing what Ars and the others will have him do. Rosal cries that he doesn't want to leave, locking himself in his room. The father apologizes for Rosal's behavior, revealing that Rosal's mother passed away two years ago, believing it to be the cause of Rosal being so underdeveloped. As normal hunters his age would be chopping down wood and training with a bow. When Rosal's father says he doesn't want Rosal to fight like the other two brothers, Ars corrects the father, stating that Rosal will be trained as a strategist, something Rosal's father isn't so opposed to. As Ars enters Rosal's room, Ars apologizes for scaring Rosal earlier, asking if Rosal likes to read books. When Ars learns that Rosal is reading the only book his mother used to read for him, Ars feels sad for Rosal, seeing Rosal admit that he's aware he isn't as talented as others. But taking this opportunity, Ars offers Rosal to visit his home's library, promising that nothing will happen to Rosal. Hearing such a tempting offer, Rosal accepts, but as Ars gets closer, 
Rosal states that he wants his brothers to come along as well. As everyone enters through R's mansion, Rosal is frightened of the mansion's dog, but R states that Charlotte will show the two older brothers around, revealing that Charlotte is the leader of their mage corp. With the brothers excitedly following Charlotte, R's and Reed shows Rosal their library, a place that holds every book in Missian. Since R's is busy, R's leaves Reed to look over Rosal, cutting to later that afternoon, where R's rushes to check up on Rosal. Upon entering, R's fears that Rosal left, but is surprised to learn Rosal is fast asleep, having knocked himself out from reading too much. Reed states that Rosal was able to grasp concepts and words instantly, leading R's to check Rosal's ingenuity stat, shocked to see his level is rising so quickly. Just then Marcus and Grotto's return to pick Rosal up, adoring Rosal who is fast asleep, only to reveal that Rosal never learned how to read, as their mother used to read to Rosal. As Rosal wakes up, Ars asks how Rosal learned how to read, only for Rosal to reveal that he had matched his mother's voice with the words in the book she read, ultimately learning to read. Rosal also mentions that he can remember most things from when he was born, shocking everyone. That night, Ars wonders how they can convince Rosal to fight with his brain, cutting to the next morning where Ars asks for Rosal to capture a boar with traps instead of a bow and arrow. When the brothers wonder if such smart creatures can be trapped, but with some encouragement from Ars and his older brothers, Rosal promises to create a trap and impress his father. Unveiling several boars trapped, Rosal shyly mentions how he didn't want his father to be forced to hunt alone when the two older brothers left. So Rosal made use of the boars' tendency to charge at yellow objects, ultimately leading the boars to funnel into wooden cages. Not only did Rosal think about his father's future, Rosal also strung up herbs to deter mother board and child boars from being trapped, even opening a small hole for the babies to escape if they get trapped. Rosal states that in order to keep the boars abundant, they would leave the mother and child boars alone, shocking their father as Rosal had foresaw and factored in everything. Without saying another word, Rosal's father orders Marcus and Grottos to take Rosal with them when they leave the next day, heading off without saying anything else. Breaking down, Rosal realizes that he may have done too much, heading home that night, only to stare out into the moon, reminding himself that his mother passed shortly after he was born. As Rosal blames himself for his mother's passing, Rosal suddenly overhears Marcus and Grotto's chatting with their father on the roof. As the boys toast to the anniversary of their mother's passing, the older brothers wonder why their father was so cold to Rosal, but their father states that he failed to recognize Rosal for his talents. Rosal's father states that he doesn't blame Rosal for hating him, as that is what the father must do to atone for failing to raise Rosal, prompting everyone to begin shedding tears. The next day Ars arrives to pick up Marcus and Grottos, shocked to see Rosal will be joining them, coldly walking past his father. Before Rosal and the boys set off, Rosal turns to his father who has begun chopping wood, crying that he could never hate his own father, promising to grow and make his father proud. As his father cries tears of joy, Marcus and Grottos thank Ars for giving them a chance for a brighter future, prompting all three boys to promise to serve Ars diligently. With Raven reaching the age of 36 and Ars turning 9 years old, Raven has become sick more often, prompting Ars to offer to take over his father's duties, but Raven refuses. One year ago, the ruler off Missian had passed away, leaving everything to his younger son, Vasmar. But the older son Corin refused to accept such a fact. Corin was well known to be inferior than Vasmark, but since Corin had made a name for himself, the province of Missian was ultimately torn between the older and younger son, and to make things worse the neighboring province of Sites has begun to invade Missian. As Ars racks his brain to figure out a solution, we see several carriages passing through a forest, even through all the lightning storms. Seeing Ars conflicted, Raven tells Ars not to worry about the war and instead to worry about his future engagement something Ars was not aware about. Rushing to the others, Ars tells them about his engagement news, but Charlotte simply teases Ars for not marrying her first. As Ars gets more annoyed, he suddenly learns that his fiancée is here to visit him, forced to greet his future wife. As the carriage door opens, Ars stiffens up, having never had a girlfriend before, but as his fiancée unveils her hood, she introduces herself as Lysia Ply. Scanning her stats, Ars notes how pretty Lysia is, but is shocked to see Lysia has a diplomacy capacity of 100 and ambition of 80. Ars realizes that Lysia is definitely cunning, wondering if Lysia is planning something. Confused as to why Ars isn't saying anything, 
Licia gets curious, but is relieved believing Ars is simply infatuated with her beauty. Offering to show everyone around his home, Ars suddenly spots Reeds running by, prompting Licia's butler to become disgusted spotting a Malkin in the mansion. But Licia silences her butler, reminding her butler that Reeds is quite formidable, ordering her butler to apologize. With Ars shocked to see Licia standing up for Reeds, Ars continues to show her around the house, amazed that Licia is so comfortable speaking with all the maids and people in the mansion. As everyone sits down for a meal, Licia compliments the meat she has been served, getting Ars to reveal that the meat is from some boars they trapped, but Licia takes the chance to tease Ars for having sauce on his face. Ars remarks that Licia is a little too perfect, but upon hearing Licia compliment his hometown of Lambert, Ars offers to show her around the next time it stops raining. As Licia smirks, Ars suddenly spots the rain stopping, shocked to learn that Licia had watched the clouds as they were traveling and deduced that it would only rain for a little bit. At the same time, Charlotte and Rosal eavesdrop on their conversation, with Rosal sensing something off about Licia, something Charlotte agrees with as she gets jealous seeing Licia so close with Ars. As Licia and Ars walk through town, Ars greets the townsfolk, introducing them to his future wife, but suddenly spots two men arguing. Running to see the commotion, only to learn that one of the customers had ordered flame magistone, but the shopkeeper instead sold the customer sound magistone. Ars fears that if he isn't able to resolve the issue, Licia will consider Ars useless, but just then Charlotte appears, threatening to men to settle down or else she'll blow everything up. Intervening, Licia diverts the conversation, instead bringing up how famous Charlotte is, getting Charlotte to stand down for now. Turning to Ars, Licia offers to resolve the situation, asking Ars to do her a favor afterwards. Approaching the men, Licia stops the men from fighting, introducing herself as Ars' future wife, temporarily stopping the men as they congratulate Ars. Licia suggests that the customer sell their soundstone to her, offering to pay a decent price for the stone. As for the shopkeeper, Licia offers to sell any amount of flame stone the shopkeeper is willing to buy. Licia also mentions how everything was Ars' idea, prompting both men to thank Ars, promising to use contracts next time. But Ars can't be more amazed at how smart Licia is. As the sun begins to set, Ars apologizes for having Licia follow him around town, but just then Charlotte butts in, praising Licia for earlier, but Charlotte still doesn't accept Licia as Ars' future wife. With Ars and Licia now alone, Licia cashes in on that favor Ars gave her, asking what type of girl Ars truly liked. Completely caught off guard, Ars wonders what Licia is scheming, but knows that since Licia is far more smarter than him, Ars chooses to answer truthfully. Ars cries that he wants to marry someone that is truthful and honest but without saying another word Licia and Ars head home, leading to later that night where Licia has dinner with everyone, followed by Charlotte putting on a magic show, only for everyone to head to bed. Since Licia is staying the night, Ars heads to bed early knowing that he'll have to entertain her tomorrow as well, but as he sits on his bed, he realizes that Licia had been waiting for him. Stopping Ars for screaming, Licia states that she wants to have an honest conversation with Ars, prompting Ars to serve up some tea. As Ars asks what Licia wants to talk about, Licia asks once again what Ars thinks of her, revealing that she has a knack of detecting what people think of her with a single glance, coupled with the ability to put people at ease with a few minutes of conversation. But Licia had noticed that Ars only grew more suspicious of her, the more time they spent together, wondering why Ars is so scared of her. Ars realizes that he had made Licia feel so sad all this time, choosing to reveal his appraisal eye that allowed him to see Licia's outrageous diplomacy and ambition stat, and that is what ultimately made Ars suspect Licia had an ulterior motive. Shocked to hear that, Licia admits that she is quite ambitious, shyly uttering that she strives to have a man fall in love with her. But seeing Ars freeze, Licia cries for Ars to say something. As Ars tries to fill in the awkward silence, Ars realizes that it's completely natural for a girl like Licia to strive to marry a powerful man, but Ars knows that neither his family nor himself can live up to Licia's expectations. Speaking up, Licia is finally happy to be able to read what Ars is thinking, stating that although Ars is not yet where he wants to be, Licia believes that Ars along with his family have the potential of becoming great and powerful in the future. Licia also mentions how the townsfolk treated Ars like their family, something Licia believes every lord should strive for ultimately admitting that Ars is the one she wants to marry. As both Ars and Licia part ways for the night, Ars scolds himself for beginning so awkwardly, only to cut to Licia outside. 
also scolding herself for being awkward. But Licia is grateful she has finally found someone that she can speak truthfully with. Licia thinks about how she was born around scummy nobles who would lie to each other in order for their own benefit, but one day Licia had watched a female noble worm her way into a marriage with a powerful man. Licia had strived to marry the most powerful man she could find, using her skill to also lie and get on people's good side, initially planning on only befriending and using ours. But as Licia spent time with ours walking around Lamberg, Licia realized how genuine and kind ours was, not only to her but to everyone no matter their status, ultimately falling in love with ours. Licia states that she wants to know what type of future ours plans on creating, vowing to crush those who stand in ours way. Cutting to several days later where ours is seen writing to Licia updating her on his life. As ours thinks about the last time Licia had visited him, ours gets shy knowing Licia is dead set on marrying ours. But ours writes that luckily Raven is recovering well and the current wars in Amicina have quieted down a bit. With some more time passing, Ars learns that his father is getting weaker by the day, wishing for some more time to repay his father for all he's done. Elsewhere in the castle of Arcantes, we see an assassin successfully take the life of the old governor. But when the guards corner the assassin, the assassin chooses to take his own life. Having heard the news, Raven sits with Ars and his party, asking Rosal what he thinks of the Missian governor being assassinated. Rosal believes that there will be war soon, something Raven knew would happen meaning the brothers Corin and Vasmark will finally start a war for the throne. Since the Lord of the Canera district, Lord Lumera, will fight for the elder brother Corin, Raven states that they'll be fighting alongside Corin as well. Raven tells Reitz to prepare the troops, expecting a letter from Lord Lumera. But as Raven tries to get out of bed, he suddenly collapses. With the letter from Lumera arriving, Ars learns that Raven must gather his troops within three days, but Ars states that since his father is unable to get out of bed, he'll be the one to go in his father's place. As Ars and his party set out to the town of Caner, they greet the guard outside the castle, informing the guard that Ars will be representing Raven. When the guard questions if Ars is capable of taking over for Raven, Charlotte speaks up, making the guard realize that he's standing before Charlotte the Lady of Flames and Reitz the Reaper. As they are guided through the castle, Ars gets teased for being nervous, but they suddenly run into the headman for Lord Lumera, Menas Renard. With Ars introducing himself, Menas prays that Raven gets well, prompting Ars to scan Menas's stats. Amazed that Menas isn't above average for all attributes. Taking the opportunity, Menas attempts to offer Reitz and Charlotte a job, but they both refuse, having sworn loyalty to Ars. With Ars being guided to the official meeting room, Ars awkwardly introduces himself, but feels out of place when none of the elderly men speak up. Upon taking a seat at the table, the Lord of Kumie, Kral Orslo speaks up, praising Ars for his confident entrance, someone Ars used to play with when he was younger. When Kral offers Ars some cookies, Ars notices another man glaring at him, but out of nowhere Lord Lumera enters the room, prompting everyone to get up and bow. Amazed by the aura that Lord Lumera Pyres emits, Ars scans Lumera's stats, noticing that Lumera doesn't necessarily boast any unique stats, but combined with Menes, they are quite the influential duo. Getting the meeting started, Lumera apologizes for the sudden meeting, but states that with war about to break out, they'll all be fighting alongside the elder brother, Corin. With Lumera confirming that there are no objections, Lumera reminds everyone that the province of Sites will try to attack during the war as well, officially ending the meeting. Having held in all his nerves, Ars lets out a sigh of relief, but realizes that Lumera is beside him, apologizing for his manners. Lumera reassures Ars not to be so stiff around him, praising Ars for walking in Raven's footsteps and growing an army to such a high caliber, especially only at the age of 11. With Lumera telling Ars he expects great things, Lumera takes his leave, prompting the other man to finally confront Ars. The man introduces himself as Hammond, the lord of the domain Torbakista, and also the father of Lycia. Wondering what Hammond wants to speak about, Ars learns that Hammond had heard that Ars had stopped writing to Licia, apologizing as Ars had been spending time looking after Raven and thinking about the upcoming war. Hammond states that Licia speaks highly of Ars, having been more open with her feelings recently. Something Hammond had never seen before as Licia used to be more obedient, especially growing up amidst conflicts between nobles. Hammond states that he blames himself for allowing his daughter to suffer at such a young age, apologizing for forcing Ars to marry Licia. 
but Ars reassures Hammond that he chose to take on Lysia's burden. With Hammond satisfied with Ars' response, Ars returns to tell Raven everything that transpired, confirming that they will be indeed fighting alongside the older brother. Seeing as Ars attended the meeting while telling him, Raven praises Ars for finally becoming a man, having worried that Ars was still too naive. Finally sitting down and writing a letter to Lysia, Ars catches Lysia up on everything that is occurring, talking about how he met Hammond, along with the unfolding war, but Ars ultimately promises to win the war to impress Lysia. Joining his men in training, Ars stands no chance against Reitz, worried that everyone but himself is growing stronger. Ars begins thinking about his mock battle he had earlier, disappointed to see that he was completely outmatched, and even failed to defend himself when attacked. Seeing as he has been relying on Charlotte and Reitz, Ars racks his brain, wondering how he can be useful in battle, but just then Rosal rushes in with a letter. Rosal reports that Sites has begun to invade Kumie, the domain belonging to Kral, and seeing as Kumie is right next to Lamberg, they have no choice but to defend Kumie. Knowing that Raven can't lead their army, Ars steals his resolve, declaring that they'll depart immediately, ordering Reitz to gather the troops. With Reitz promising to look after Ars, Ars declares that he'll be leaving the army, but out of nowhere Raven appears. With Ars worried that his father is too unwell to fight, Raven states that Ars is still too young to fight, ordering Reitz to stand down when he tries to persuade Raven against going to war in his condition. When Ars tries to reassure Raven that he'll be safe with Charlotte and Reitz by his side, Raven reveals that Ars's face does not resemble a warrior just yet, confusing Ars. To make things clear, Raven orders Guller to retrieve one of the men they've imprisoned, having Baramorda the criminal kneel before everyone. Raven reveals that Baramorda had committed every crime under the sun, stating that they'll now execute the criminal, but tasks Ars with keeping his composure if Ars wants to be acknowledged as a man by Raven. Seeing Baramorda being placed in position for an execution, Ars helplessly listens as Baramorda begins listing off his fantasies, only for Raven to give the signal to execute the criminal. As Ars lays witness to the criminal's head being severed, Ars can't help but turn away, collapsing onto his knees. But this shows to Raven that Ars is still not ready for the horrors of war. As it begins to rain, Raven begins heading out with his army, ordering Ars's party to follow as well, leaving Ars by himself, crying out that he is still too weak. Cutting to the battlefield, Reitz rides beside Raven, all whilst Rosal gives orders and Charlotte decimates the battlefield with her magic. As Raven begins coughing up blood, from the one-month dispute, it's reported that Raven's army was able to defeat an army double their size, but unfortunately as Raven returns home, he's seen very weak, arriving four days after Ars' 12th birthday. With Ars' family rushing to check on Raven, Ars welcomes the others home, shocking everyone as Ars has been training whilst everyone was gone. Ars asks about his father's conditions, disappointed that he had forced his father to push his already sick body. But his party reassures Ars that it was Raven's duty to take over. As Ars leaves to train some more, Charlotte reveals that she had heard Ars has been non-stop training, something that stresses Ars' party out. But out of nowhere Lysia visits, apologizing for the sudden visit. Lysia states that she's been worried about Ars, having kept in touch with Ars through their letters, but Lysia admits that she feels more distant from Ars as his written letters feel very cold. Seeing as Lysia is distraught, Reitz reasons he should tell Lysia about how Raven had tested Ars' manhood, ultimately left behind when Ars failed to face the horrors of taking another human's life. Lysia apologizes for not even being able to help, demanding to speak with Ars herself, guided towards the training area of the mansion. Upon entering, Lysia is relieved to see Ars focused with training, but when Ars collapses, Lysia admires Ars for forcing himself back onto his feet, even though Ars is completely exhausted. With Lysia leaving Ars to train, she tells everyone that she'll let Ars grow for now, but suddenly a maid rushes to inform everyone that Raven is awake, but Raven wishes to speak with Ars' party privately. As Rosal, Reitz and Charlotte stand before Raven, Raven apologizes for passing out after the war, shocking the three as Raven is too casual with them. Raven states that he wants to get to know the three better, asking what each of them feel living their new lives, prompting all three to state that they would like to continue living the life they have now. Happy to hear that, Raven reveals that he knows he is not long for this world, thanking the three for changing his worldview. As he had never thought a Malkin, a woman and a child would end up being the pillars of his domain. Getting serious, 
Raven states that he knows forcing Ars to rule over his domain is a selfish act, admitting that he wished he would have trained Ars more seriously. But now that he has no time left, Raven begs the three to please continue supporting and guiding Ars. As Raven makes this request as a father, Raven begins shedding tears, knowing that he can't look over Ars any longer. Reciprocating Raven's feelings, Rosal states that Ars is the person that ultimately brought his family together and gave him confidence. Charlotte adds that Ars is the person that gave her hope for the future and Reitz declares that Ars believed in him when no one else will. With Raven satisfied to hear that all three swear complete loyalty to Ars, the three bow their heads, thanking Raven for accepting them. But Reitz asks for a favor. Having waited outside, Licia requests to speak with Raven privately, formally introducing herself, only to learn that Raven and herself have met before. Raven reveals that when he first met Licia, he noticed that Licia was more mature than most kids her age, even going as far as to treat everyone equally, someone Raven wanted by Ars side. Raven reminds Licia that Ars isn't a perfect human, but Licia cries that Ars is trying as hard as he can to become like Raven, something Raven can't help but smile at, happy to see that Licia has indeed fallen in love with Ars. With Licia leaving Raven's room, she tells the others that Raven wishes to speak with Ars, but first thanks Reitz for being so kind to her. As everyone goes on ahead, Reitz slowly reminisces on the fond times with Raven, crying out in agony at the horrible situation. As Ars rushes to greet his father, Ars reports that he's been studying to find a cure for Raven's sickness, but Raven states that Ars truly has grown. Raven reveals that he was Ars' age when he became a warrior, having grown up in a farming village in the Messina province, under the rule of a corrupt tyrant. One day Raven had run away at ten, visiting the cities, only to lay eyes on the admirable lord of the town. From that day on, Raven trained his sword skills, climbing the ranks from a soldier to a lord only to finally be granted his own domain. As Raven begins thinking fondly of his past, Raven suddenly begins coughing profusely, reminding Ars that his poor health is not Ars' fault. With Ars holding back his tears, Ars declares that he will take over Raven's duties whenever Raven wants him to, impressing Raven as he sees Ars as more prepared than ever. When Raven apologizes for having Ars be burdened by everything, Ars reassures Raven that he's grateful to be Raven's son, spending the entire night learning about his father's history. As Ars and his family sit through the night telling stories to each other, we cut to the next day where Raven had finally passed away, the 212th year of the Summerfirth calendar, where everyone sends Raven off with a proper ceremony. During the ceremony, Ars calls for his siblings, cries and Ren to say goodbye to Raven, only for Ars himself to approach his father, placing a single flower on Raven's casket. Ars declares that he knows he's not as competent as his father, but Ars promises to take care of everyone just like Raven has been, asking for everyone to support him, prompting all the townsfolk to cheer Ars on. At the same time, Charlotte remembers a time during a battle where Raven had instructed Charlotte to save her energy for when she needs to fight alongside Ars. Rosal remembers a time when Raven had instructed Rosal to take it easy and not push himself so much, especially being a child. Licia thinks back on their chat the previous night, promising to remain by our side, only for Ars to officially declare he'll be taking over as master of the Luvent House, prompting everyone to kneel before their new master. That evening, we cut into town where a lady is seen drunk, overhearing some men talk about the Missian brothers' most recent dispute over the throne, demanding to know more about the dispute. With three months passing since Raven's death, Ars visits Raven's grave, apologizing for not meeting Raven's expectations yet, but promises he'll make his father proud with the help of his allies. At the castle of Kinnair, Lumera, Kral and Hammond all pray out of respect for Raven's passing, only for Lumera to declare that Ars will now take over as head of the House of Luvet. As Ars declares that he'll do his best, Kral and Hammond both praise how much Ars has grown, only for Lumera to state that Ars is now their equal. Officially starting the meeting, Lumera reveals that the older brother Corin has finalized their army, meaning that the real war will begin soon, but Menas steps up to explain extra details. Menas states that the capital of Missian, Arcantes, is currently under rule by the younger brother Vasmar. Menas adds that although Vasmar currently has a bigger army than their forces, Corin still controls the trading city of Semplar meaning that the brothers are still overall even. Menace states that both brothers will be trying to convince neighboring districts to join their side, noting how Pereina, the district to the west, refuses to choose either side. 
Menes reveals that Pereina holds the shortest route they could use to attack Arcantes, meaning it is a must for Lumera and the others to convince Pereina to side with them. Lumera says he's tried to convince Pereina before, stating that he plans to subjugate the district, but not wanting to resort to violence straight away, Ars asks for permission to try their own tactics at convincing Pereina. Cutting to several days ago, Ars and his party are seen analyzing the upcoming war, but Rosal points out how suspicious it is for the Pereina to remain where they are, even though Pereina knows they are quite vulnerable to invasions. Rosal advises Ars to check out the situation in Pereina first before they mindlessly march into enemy territory, prompting Reeds to suggest they hire mercenaries by the name of Shadows, a group of talented information gatherers. Ars mentions how Pereina seems suspicious to have rejected siding either side, even though they can be invaded at any time, convincing Lumera to give Ars some time to figure out what is happening. As the gang head through town exhausted, they run into the orphans Charlotte had been taking care of, amazed that they've grown so much. With Ars greeting the ladies that own the orphanage, Ars reveals that he had instructed the ladies to take in as many orphans out on the street as possible. Satisfied to see the orphans are growing up well, Charlotte asks her kids what they'll be doing when they grow up, amused to hear one wants to join Lumere's army. One wants to work as a maid in the Canaire castle. One wants to work in a bakery and one wants to work on a farm in Lamberg. When the kids thank Ars for giving them a home, Ars reveals that Charlotte donates her salary to the kids every time, making Charlotte proud seeing that orphans now have a home to grow up in. Charlotte admits it was the right call to leave the kids in town seeing as the capital has far more opportunities than if Charlotte housed the kids in Lambert. Out of nowhere Licia appears, having been visiting the castle of Canaire, but having heard that Ars was in town, Licia came to visit Ars. Ars thanks Licia for coming, but notes how he's not mentally ready to speak with her yet, but Licia admires Ars for creating a home for the less fortunate orphans. Out of nowhere an orphan rushes to hug Licia, accidentally dirtying her dress, but when Ars apologizes for causing Licia so much issues, Licia surprisingly removes her boots, chasing and playing with the kids, something Ars admires about Licia. As the gang stay the night at the orphanage, Licia asks what Ars has planned, learning that Reitz has managed to get in touch with Shadow, and Ars plans to negotiate with them tomorrow. Interested? Licia asks if she can accompany Ars tomorrow, shocking Ars as he fears Licia will get hurt. But Licia manages to convince Ars to let her join them. When Ars promises to pick Licia up the next day, Licia reveals that she'll be staying with Ars at the orphanage, scaring Ars, as Licia wants to share a bed with Ars. But this manages to wake Charlotte up, annoyed at how close Licia is getting with Ars. As Reitz rushes to report something to Ars, Reitz is shocked to see Charlotte and Licia fighting over Ars. But when Rosal tries to leave them alone, Rosal gets dragged into sharing a bed with the three, all whilst Reitz manages to escape. As the girls greet Ars the next morning, Ars and Rosal note how they failed to get any sleep. But suddenly Reitz notifies Ars that he's received a message from Shadow. With Ars and his party thanking the orphanage for the hospitality, they part way with the kids, all spotting Charlotte proud of what she's helped build. Ars asks where they'll be meeting with Shadow, learning that their meeting point is outside of town in a bar impressing Ars as Reitz had managed to make contact with them. Reitz reveals that his old mercenary group used to do work with Shadow, as Reitz's group specialized in frontline combat whereas Shadow focused on recon work. Hearing that Shadow also partakes in intelligence, espionage and assassinations, Ars gets terrified. But Reitz is more worried about Shadow's leader, having heard the leader was replaced by a younger bloke. Ars learns that the younger person has made Shadow the greatest they've ever been before, interesting Ars and Licia. But Reed states that Shadow only takes jobs that interest them and money isn't the only factor. With the gang entering the bar, several female workers immediately swarm Ars, adoring how cute Ars is. But this annoys Charlotte and Licia. At the same time, an employee refuses to serve Ars and his party, stating that they're full at the moment. But Reed's rebuttals with a code phrase, prompting the employee to assign Ars and his party a table in the back. As the gang sit down, they all notice other customers glaring at them, but they decide to ignore everyone and order some food while they wait for Shadow to arrive. Beginning to scan the surrounding customers, Ars deduces that Shadow might be hiding amongst the crowd. But when Ars goes to order something from one of the waitresses, Ars suddenly freezes. Having scanned the waitress's stats, Ars apologizes, choosing to order some juice, only to head to the bathroom. But Licia knows Ars is acting strange. 
calming himself down, Ars checks to see if his appraisal skill is working, but wonders why his eye assessed the waitress as having a prowess of 92, an ingenuity of 90 and is in fact a 22-year-old man. Out of nowhere, the waitress drags Ars into a nearby room with a knife, demanding to know how Ars knows he's the leader of Shadow. Luckily Reitz arrives, disarming and freeing Ars only to threaten the leader for attempting to harm Ars. The leader praises Ars for calling in backup, but Ars notes how he didn't, revealed to be Lysia who asked Reitz to save Ars. Stepping up, Lysia shames the leader for trying to harm Ars, suggesting that the leader help them out, but the leader refuses wondering why he simply can't just kill everyone here and flee. Lysia reveals that she knows the leader wouldn't be able to escape now that Reitz is here. But as Ars shakes seeing how serious everyone is, the leader asks what if he manages to escape, prompting Lysia to state she'll devote her entire life hunting the leader down. Breaking into laughter, the leader admits that Lysia has got him cornered, asking Ars how he knew who he was, but doesn't trust Ars, when Ars says he has an appraisal on. To prove it, Ars calls the leader Mazik, a name the leader threw away a long time ago, now going by the name Fam. Now convinced of Ars' skill, Fam agrees to take on any job Ars has to offer, stating that he knows Ars is quite interesting based on how much Reitz and Lysia respect Ars. As Fam asks to speak more privately in the back, Ars thanks the two for saving him, learning that Lysia had deduced the waitress was Shadow's leader based on Ars' shocked expression. As they all head to a more private room, Ars asks Fam to investigate Pereina, surprised to hear that Fam will take one gold for the job, agreeing to meet back within five days. Back with Charlotte and Rosal, Charlotte is seen devouring the food, both wondering why Ars' bathroom break is taking so long. As the trio return to the table, Ars tells Charlotte and Rosal that they just had a meeting with Shadow, surprising Charlotte as she wanted to meet Shadow herself. Just then, Fam appears in his waitress disguise, serving Charlotte and Rosal, only to leave without the two realizing that Fam was Shadow, something that terrifies Ars. Several days later, Ars and Reitz reunite with Fam, wondering where Fam's other workers are, shocked to hear that Fam took on Ars' job alone. Ars notes how Fam's overwhelming skills overrides his mediocre leadership skills, as people around him consider him the leader out of respect. With Fam confirming that he was indeed able to investigate Pereina's secrets, Ars wonders how Fam found the information so fast, handed a scroll with the reasons why Pereina won't side with Corin. Opening up the scroll, Ars realizes that it contains all the signatures of the nobles who have sided with the younger brother Vasmark, noticing Pereina is among the few. Additionally, Ars spots the Masa district as well, a district west within Emission and has a large population housing powerful infantry like the capital of Mission, Arcantes. Reitz mentions how they were told Masa had agreed to side with the older brother Corin just like Ars, but for some reason the scroll shows that Masa is now with Vasmark, implying that Masa had betrayed them. Ars knows that if they choose to invade Pereina, since Masa is right beside Pereina, Masa would simply use the chance to counter their invasion. Fam suspects that Pereina had already decided that siding with Corin is a losing battle, especially with Masa siding with Vasmark. But Reitz asks if Fam can reveal how he got the scroll not 100% trusting Fam. Fam states that he doesn't share how he investigates things with anyone, reassuring Reitz that the scroll is authentic, but this prompts Reitz to glare at Fam. Understanding the situation, Reitz apologizes for doubting Fam, but Fam says it's fine since it's all business. With Ars amazed at Fam's ninja skills, Ars tries to pay Fam the rest of the money he owes. But Fam's tells Ars to keep the money, apologizing for attacking him the other day. Grateful, Ars promises to do more business with Fam in the future, heading out to inform Lumera about Masa's betrayal. That night, Ars shows Lumera the document, surprising Lumera as Masa had always spoken highly of Corin, knowing that they must act quick. Lumiere has Mena show Torbakista and Kumie the document, thanking Ars for his hard work. As Lumera asks Ars to help speak with Corin himself, Mena suddenly notices something off with the scroll, noting how the Masa seal doesn't seem authentic. Heading into a separate room, Mena shows off Masa's original seal, noting how the one on the document is similar but not exact. This leads Lumera to believe that Masa's seal was forged, tricking Pereina into siding with Vasmar. Lumera reveals that Menas has a unique skill that allows him to discern fine details, something Ars was not aware of since his eye doesn't allow him to see a user's stats. Ars wonders why someone would trick Pereina, 
but Reitz and Rosal deduce that the enemy plans to use Pereina to buy some time. Reitz mentions how if they invade Pereina, Pereina without Massa will fall, but this will buy the enemy enough time to acquire the Explosion Magic Stones. Lumera reveals that Explosion Magic Stones are rare gems that can only be found within three districts, one of which being Pereina. Since the gems are very rare, Having the ability to give mages powerful destructive spells can even be used to craft catastrophic weapons, meaning that Vastmark plans to use the chaos of Pereina being invaded to mine as much explosion magistones as possible. Hearing all of this, Rosal speaks up, stating that invading Pereina is no longer an option, as Vastmark plans on using Pereina to tire out Lumer's forces. Therefore their goal should be convincing Pereina to side with them even though Pereina has been hesitant too. Several days later, we cut to the headman of Pereina, greeting Ars and his followers, who has come to announce that they want to side with Vastmark. Ars chooses to act shocked, having heard that Masa has planned to side with Vastmark, pleasing the headman as he utters that Ars and Lumera is wise to join the winning side. As the headman gets up to inform Vastmark of the great news, Ars asks how the headman acquired the document in the first place, learning that Vastmark handed the headman the document himself. Ars utters how Masa betraying Corin is quite random, but the headman mentions how things get messy during war. But not stopping Ars cries that the headman didn't confirm if Masa truly is siding with Vasmark. Annoyed, the headman realizes that Ars isn't really here to join Vasmark's side, having his men arrest Ars and his followers. Springing into action, Reed spies Ars some time, allowing Ars to reveal that he has brought the headman of Masa himself to clear things up. Flashing back, we see that Rosal had planned to have the headman of Masa clear things up, leading to Ars and his party showing the headman of Massa the forged signature. Pissed that Vasmark would rely on such underhanded tactics, the headman of Massa agreed to visit Pereina personally, leading to the present where the headman for Massa reveals that his signature was indeed forged. The headman of Massa reminds Pereina that he has sided with Corin since he was brought to power and intends to die whilst serving Corin, demanding to know what side the headman for Pereina will now side with. The headman for Pereina admits that he should side with Corin now, afraid that Corin won't accept him after his betrayal. But the headman for Masa states that he's aware that both Masa and Pereina simply wants what is best for the citizens forgiving the headman of Pereina for the betrayal but allows Ars to make the final decision. Surprised, Ars states it was a simple mistake, happy that the headman of Pereina figured out the truth before any unnecessary bloodshed. As the headman reports his realliance with Corin to Lumera, we cut to Ars telling his father about everything that transpired, Happy to report that Pereina is now sided with Corin, but was shocked to what the Vasmark had still managed to acquire some explosion magistones. As Rosal and Reitz join Ars, they mention how cold it is, making Ars realize something. Staring off into the sunset, Ars thanks Reitz and Rosal for always staying by him, grateful to hear that Reitz and Rosal plan to serve Ars for the rest of their lives. Just then a maid informs Ars they have a visitor, surprised to see Lumera and Menas is here to pray for Raven. Out of nowhere, Lumera reveals that Lord Corin wants to speak with Ars, terrifying Ars as Corin is a powerful figure, but with Rosal and Reitz encouraging Ars, Ars musters up the courage to meet Corin. Check out one of our other videos on the screen or in the info card above. Subscribe, like and comment.